Okay, so welcome to the final session of today. Today we are joined by Professor Sebastian Rodel, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Leipzig. The subject of his systematic work is the nature of human thought and action, philosophy of mind and language, epistemology, moral philosophy, and theory of action. His publications include self consciousness and objectivity, categories of the temporal, and self consciousness. Uh, we're extremely happy that you could join us today, Professor Rodel. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here and happy that this conference can be held after having been first postponed. I've been excited to be there for a long time. And um, I'm going to present um, part of what I laid out in a paper, which originally was meant to be a lecture at an earlier time for that conference. <laughs> it grew into a long paper that Andrea Gambarotti, I don't know whether he is here, has read in full. <laughs> um, it's much too long. Um, and I'm not sure I've found a way to shorten it. So I was, I'm afraid that what I will say will not be as well rounded as one might wish. But I think it, or hope it will be able to engage what other people have uh, said uh, in the course of this conference so as to be a fruitful uh, contribution. In the science of logic, Hegel represents the animal under the title idea. Um, now, I want to lay out what it means that the animal is idea. Uh, in the first section, and you see uh, the structure of the lecture on the handout, uh, I introduce what Hegel calls idea. Uh, I then explain uh, how the science of logic introduces the animal as the immediate idea namely by revealing it to be the truth of objectivity. Um, and I end with explaining in the third section how Hegel therewith articulates a logical understanding of consciousness, or for after all, the animal is consciousness. I may not come to that section. Um, so Hegel places the animal under the heading life uh, in the chapter of the science of logic that he calls idea, and that chapter follows upon the chapter objectivity, which in turn follows the chapter subjectivity, um, all three of which constitute the subjective logic or the logic of the concept. The concept, uh, I understand to mean here thought, and so I understand that part of the logic to be the articulation of the self-comprehension of thought, and as thought turns to itself, articulating its comprehension of itself, it first thematizes itself as thinking and thus expounds its, its understanding of what it is to think. Um, and thereupon it, uh, and it, it articulates um, its understanding of itself as an articulation of what it thinks, as what is such as to be thought. That is to say, the subject of thought and the object of thought, however the uh, terms of thought can go, and it will emerge in a second why they can go. And we can speak simply of the subject and the object, subject and object. Um, now, um, uh, this opposition or this formula, uh, subject and object uh, is familiar perhaps too familiar to any student of philosophy, uh, along with uh, many other such formulae, and I'll mention a few, knowledge and reality, mind and world, thinking and being, to add a particularly noteworthy one, word and object. Um, now, um, these um, oppositions are peculiar in that the second of the terms in each case is universal. And I will explain what I mean by universal, and that will be the sense in which I will then try to explain what it means that the animal is universal. And the second of the terms are always like, like object, reality, being, object, yeah. Um, Universal. Let's start with being. 
and consider that that idea. Uh, now, I gave you the quote of um, Metaphysics Gamma 1, Aristotle explains there is a science that studies, or that theory, what is insofar as it is, and what pertains to it as such, or what belongs to it as such. Um, and this, this, this science is um, not the same, he goes on to say, as any of the further ones, uh, for um, none of these other sciences inquires into what is as insofar as it is generally katolu, but rather all of these, what they do is they cut out for themselves a part of it uh, in order uh, and, um, and study of what, what pertains to that part. So, uh, so uh, the term and the science here is introduced um, through its object being, but that is a very peculiar object in that it is formally different from the object of any other science in that it is not as well brought out by any form of circumscription, by any form of delimiting something from something. This is what all the other sciences do. They delimit, they cut out, uh, he says, what they study. When we identify a science by the term being, we do not cut out anything. On the contrary, anything, any cutting out of the kind here in view is a cutting out from within to on, what is. Yeah. Um, being thus um, is a term um, that is uh, formally different from any concept that distinguishes that which is thought through it from that which is not. It is also a concept that's formally different from any concept that is different from an other concept that can be placed next to it, but on the same plane. That is um, the formal character of that concept, which I will refer to as uni universal, and I call it universal. I mark a distinction between universal and general, which is not made in, Aristotle, in, in Hegel because he always, think, when he talks about general, I think it always has in view the universal in, in, in the logic. Um, but good, um, universal concept, illimitable. Yeah. Um, what Aristotle says, uh, and that's the same thought that I want to expand here, says that being is not a genus. It's not a genus. It doesn't belong in a series of species and genus of relative, uh, uh, or gener uh, higher generality of ascending generalities. There's no term in such a sequence of concepts. Perhaps one last thing to say about it. Hegel calls it in the very beginning of the logic when he discusses being, he describes it as the absolute abstraction. Um, the absolute abstraction, and we can see what it means uh, when we ascend in generality from one concept to the next, from species to genus, we can say that we abstract. That is, we abstract the more general concept from the more specific one by leaving out certain determinations. Now, the absolute abstraction is one in which every determination is, as it were, left outside. However, this, uh, we must always note that when the term absolute, when the adjective absolute is when we modify something, this doesn't mean that it's a sort of a kind of that thing, so like absolute idealism. Uh, it's not ideal. It's not a species of idealism. Absolute abstraction is not a species of abstraction. Absolute abstraction. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> that's the universal. Now, um, the fact that this, the second term in our oppositions are universal, being reality, raises a question when we think about those formula, subject and object knowledge and reality, mind and world. They raise what then figures in certain philosophical conundrums as the location problem. It figures in this way, when we say knowledge and reality, what do we mean to say by placing knowledge on the same plane as reality? Do we mean to say that knowledge is not real? Is knowledge unreal then? if we oppose knowledge and reality. Now, when we say mind and world, is the mind not in the world? 
Do we, when we say thinking and being, is thinking not something that is? Do we place it in unbeing when we say thinking and being? Now that seems wrong. We are sober-minded and say, of course, knowledge is one of the things that are, and the mind is in the world. Um, knowledge is a certain reality. Now, but when we, when we say this, sober as we are, we should wonder why anyone ever got it into his mind to speak of knowledge and reality. What he should, what she should have been speaking of is reality, and reality one bit of reality and another bit of reality why did quine call his major work word and object isn't a word an object so why didn't he say one object and another object there's there are these objects trees and there's another object tree and now this is an object this, these two objects interest us and we well um, but uh, when we speak in this way, in fact, we uh, no longer deploy the universal idea at all. Because we now speak of you know, trees and tree. Um, but um, we speak of bits of reality, this bit, this bit and that bit, and this object and that object, uh, like about the object as we wanted to. We don't. Word and object, no articles. Subject and object, no article. No, there are no, no articles. There is there. Make it, make it, make it generic, people say. Okay. Okay, well, we say, okay, that's all to the better. The universal idea may anywhere, anyway seem bogus. It's hyperbolic totalization uh, must raise suspicion. Let's not speak about reality. Let's speak about snow and trees. Why speak about reality? That seems, that seems dubious. But then we must wonder why anyone ever went in for this. Why not stick to snow and white as opposed to being and reality? Why did anyone go into his mind to speak of reality? Well, the answer lies in our oppositions themselves and indeed in the first term. For the universality of the second term is opened up in the first. Knowledge is itself the idea of reality. What is known is reality. The idea of knowledge is not the idea of a bit of reality. The idea of knowledge is the idea of reality. Thinking is, or at any rate, aspires to be of being, of what is. The idea of thought, therefore, includes the idea of being, not of certain beings, but of being. And indeed, the idea of language, of word, includes the idea of object, not of certain objects, but of object. So the first term of our opposition, in each case, cannot be thought without thinking precisely the universal. So thus we are cast back on our original notion innocently expressed in the familiar formula, subject and object. Thinking lies on the same plane as being, not this or that being, but being. Mutatus mutandis for all the other pairs. Now, since the second term is the universal idea, we have certified that, We've made ourselves certain of that, that it is the universal idea, it cannot be reduced to a general concept. Since the second term is the universal idea, the first term in turn cannot be a general concept. Thinking is not a general concept. Um, knowledge is not a general concept. As we are cast back on our original notion, the notion that these are on the same plane, we again confront the question, is not knowledge something real? Is not a subject, a certain object? Is not a mind, 
something in the world. But now we cannot cave. We cannot say simply this. For then we lose the universal idea. An inchoate awareness of the universality of both terms of our formula is the source of the famous location problem. I think um, it is good to have in view as a, as a way of making clear to oneself what is involved in the chapter idea. The difficulty is expounded, for example, by Thomas Nagel, much admired philosophy, uh, philosopher, in uh, his article, The Objective Self, or have in view Wittgenstein's uh, ex postulations <laughs> about the subject being the limit of the world. And th these, these are as well, ways in which, or Anscombe's famous thesis that I does not refer. I is not a referring expression, you know that. Yeah, of course not. See, that's the point. That, this is what, uh, this, is, this is a way of saying that there's no simple answer to the questions that we, that are brought up by our opposition and by the recognition of the universality of the second term, namely, is not knowledge something real? Of course it is. It's one of the real things to be encountered. No, that answer is no good. And, that, and that's something that's brought out by philosophers like Nagel or Anscombe. Yeah, they, 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 see, they see the problem, and that is the problem. I think I want to urge anyway that is Hegel's uh, concern. Or that, uh, that, is what, that is where he speaks. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, The, the, um, this opposition, therefore, knowledge and reality and so on, um, is to be understood in such a way that both terms of the opposition are universal. And this, but now we also know that the universal idea is not a general concept. It is not a concept that is meant to distinguish one thing from another. Being is not such a concept, that's how I explain it. Um, so it's clear that the terms of the op opposition are but one, the universal idea. It's this, therefore, we see that in this formula, we see that the universal, or we can also, we can recognize that the universal is itself an opposition, an opposition of itself to itself. This formula register the self-opposition of the universal idea, that, which is, that's a, I think, uh, ah, catch up, please. And therefore, we can understand now the subjective logic in such a way as to expound the self opposition of the universal and in the third chapter to articulate the comprehension of the, as it were, selfness of the opposition and the understanding of it as being the opposition of the universal to itself and thus to recognize itself as nothing other than that opposition. That's the uh, third chapter, uh, the idea. Yeah. So now the animal is the idea. That uh, the animal is that. Hmm. Now it's natural to consider animals as a certain kind of thing. Among the manifold kinds of things that we encounter in experience or in nature, things with a peculiar character being somehow active of their own account and possessing a soul, perhaps, or at any rate, a mind, which is the seat of peculiar states, states of consciousness, mental states. Now, we poorly understand that kind of being. It's very mysterious. We must devote intense scientific efforts to develop adequate theories of these recalcitrant features of the animal, its activity, its consciousness. We need a science of consciousness, science of the animal. Now, when Hegel places the animal in the third chapter of the subjective logic, he indicates 
Now, this is a confusion. No development of science will make the least progress in understanding the animal because it will, by its form, locate the animal within the sphere of objectivity. It is to raise this confusion to the second power to call for an animal science, this call is now heard, that is more attuned to the subjectivity of the animal. Now, some motion in animal studies that now wants to be aware you know, that, the subject, that the animal is not so objectified. Subject. Animal signs are. Sorry. One might think is, is, uh, the chapter objectivity, mechanism, chemism, teleology. Oh, well, okay. So physics, chemistry, and then perhaps biology, because it's very teleological. Uh, it's very teleological, like uh, the discourse of biology all the time, and they speak what things are for and so on. No, living doesn't figure in the chapter objectivity. It doesn't figure in the articulation of the idea of what's there to be known. It doesn't figure as that of which we could try uh, or sensibly uh, seek a theory. No theory of the animal. No, no. Um, okay. Where are we? Okay. Um, let me try to bring out what, what, how this, um, um, I'm going to speak a bit about the progression to the immediate idea. Um, and I can draw on things that have been said uh, by Philip and others here. Uh, mechanism. Well, let me introduce mechanism in its relation to teleology very quickly. Mechanism is a form of comprehension by which something is happening is understood by seeing it as manifesting a rule, which rule has a condition which resides in some things having happened. That's basically kind of second analogy. And I think that's what Hegel talks about in a mechanism. Now, teleology is a form of understanding in which the condition of some things happening is understood and explained by that of which it is the condition. Thereby, you can see this in biological discourse, for example, the form of general statements in that discourse is categorical. It's the condition is itself understood through that of which it is the condition, the understanding is unconditional. Let me give an example, let me see, find this um, uh, example. Um, now, let's consider the process of DNA replication. Um, a condition for the replication of the sequence of amino acids is um, uh, in one chord, is that a certain enzyme it's called helicase. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. Be on the scene. And this enzyme prevents the cords from re reuniting. So when you read along, you know how this happens. You, know, you, you read, okay, the cords are being separated by this enzyme, but then they're held separate because otherwise they would go together and there, and there couldn't be a um, synthesis of um, the cord along the separated cords if there weren't this enzyme. So that's a condition of that happening. DNA replication. If helicase is not there, that's not happening. That's a condition um, of its happening. Yeah. Um, now, um, a teleological understanding understands the presence of that enzyme at that time by the DNA is being replicated. In this way, the helicase is present in order to prevent the separated cords to reunite. This is what you will read in any textbook. Why is it present? Why is it there? So that the cords do not unite. Yeah. Um, so that the sequence of amino acids can be replicated along that cord. Um, you see, when, when, when you think of um, teleological and mechanical explanation in this way, you see immediately how teleological explanation subsumes mechanical explanation. It's, it's matter, if this will work. Um, uh, for example, the chemical nature of helicase is not effaced by the end, which explains 
uh, its activity within DNA replication. On the contrary, it is in virtue of this nature that it is purposive to this end. Okay. Um, say briefly, this, I did this comprehension of this sketch of um, teleology explanation already explains to us what it means to say, as both Kant and Hegel say, that teleology is nothing other than a concept realizing itself. This, this is so because you can understand why things happen, which are conditions for DNA replication, by understanding them as that which happens in order that DNA replicates. So you understand DNA replication through itself. Yeah, it, and, this, and this explains the curious categorical form of the biological discourse. Yeah, as Michael Thompson puts it, these descriptions, for example, of DNA replication, they say simply, or as Thompson puts it, sans phrase, this and that, happens. They don't say, the, or they may say, this happens, then that happens, then that happens. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, now, um, we are in the chapter objectivity, and thus we articulate the concept of what is to be known. We, are kin we articulate the very idea of object, um, not of a particular domain, of object, objectivity we are discussing. Um, I want to uh, stress that teleology, as thus explained, is, and that was something that Philip also stressed, and I can uh, build on this here, is an idea of objectivity. It is not local, and one can quickly see that it cannot be localized. It cannot be, it makes no sense to say, well, on the whole, you know, things go mechanically, but then here, 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 here there, you know, we can explain things teleologically. That makes um, no, no sense um, because, as we're teleology, our, what is explained teleologically cannot be, as we're um, placed within an objectivity that otherwise is mechanically understood. What is understood teleologically can have no mechanical explanation and itself can explain nothing mechanically. I will not elaborate this, but no, just assert it and perhaps we come, come back, but I hope it's um, been made clear by the very detailed discussion of Philip, but I, I think that's not just a point of Hegel exegesis, that's a, it's true. Um, <clears throat> so now, because teleology is the universal idea, that is the idea of objectivity, Therefore, it comes to grief. Why does it come to grief? The very, I mean, only when we see this are we, and we can we see the significance of the observation of Hegel that it is caught in a double regress, the regress of means and the regress of ends. Anything that is a means can be a means only insofar as it is an end. It cannot be itself um, have a condition that is only mechanically a condition of it. All, all condition of the means must be such as to be comprehended through it, the means. Otherwise, the end to which it is, the means will not be an end and it will not be a means. Sorry, this is too quick. And I'm just, just going to count on your familiarity with this double regress. Now, this double regress says that every means, as means, is an end. And that every end, as end, is a means. Now, within external teleology, this is a disaster. This just, this just is the collapse. Because external teleology is external, that is to say, it insists that the means to an end is precisely as means to this end, not the end of this end as the means to it. And that, that, that is the very form of uh, comprehension that we are describing. However, when we um, reconsider and um, do not allow ourselves to be stuck within external theology, we recognize that in this formula I just recited, we have expounded an idea. Every means, as means, is an end. 
Every n has n is a means. What have we described? That's the transition. So if we reread that which is the double request, which is a disaster within the external theology, we reread it, say it again, say it again, but in such a way as to recognize that the disaster is only imposed upon us by our insistence on the externality, which means that the insight that we have is that the truth of external theology is life. Um, now, life, um, um, there, there is, there, I'm, I'm only discussing that the first two of these processes, the, 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 there is a, I mentioned three processes, internal, external genus, also called subjective process, actually remarkably the first one, and objective process, uh, the other. Um, the external one is also called the objective process. Um, I want to um, um, say something about how the external process um, is, is where revealed as um, that through which the internal process is um, or retains its, its comprehensibility. Um, and um, uh, <clears throat> Okay, I, should, I don't know whether I can improvise this um, as well. Now, um, Hegel very early says, I don't have the text now exactly before me, but he introduces the idea of an individual. And I think the idea of the individual here has a quite specific, as it were, force. Um, namely, um, this um, an individual um, is a totality of determinations each of which is understandable only through that totality of determinations, which thus is the, is the individual. Um, from our description of a totality where every element is means and ends of every element, we see that it is an individual in that sense. Um, Now, um, sorry, I'm just, uh, I want to mark the distinction between individual and the particular. A particular is special. It has determinations that others lack, from which it thereby differs. By the same token, its determinations are such that they may be exhibited by other particulars which particulars then will be the same as it with regard to these. A particular then stands to be compared to other particulars. Say so they're the, the, the same in this respect and they differ in that respect. None of particulars. The individual as such repels this form of thought. Its determinations are the internal articulation of it, the individual. They introduce no reference to anything other. Hegel explains that while theoretical knowledge descends to ever more particular particularity, so the point he says this, it never reaches the individual. Individuality doesn't lie on a path of ever more particular particularity. And that's actually the counterpart of what well, I said before, that the universal doesn't lie on a path of ever ascending generality. Just as the universal doesn't lie on a path of ever ascending generality, so the individual doesn't lie on a path of ever descending particularity. When I was in the, in the US for a year with my family, I was uh, being told by the teachers of my children that my children were very special. No, it's not on my <laughs> What's wrong? No, this, this was meant as a compliment or, so, or something good. I thought it's terrible. <laughs> Very special. The individual is not special. Not special. The um, conception of someone as an individual is not of him as very special. It's different from this. Other. It's um, 
everything I say, everything I think about this individual is already governed by the totality that is this individual. That's what makes that, that um, sorry. Okay, good. The animal is an individual, just as we have arrived at it very logically. Eh? Um, now, uh, good. Um, now, um, I want briefly to, uh, to mention a really great paper by Christopher Frey on Aristotle. Uh, it's called the, the Blood in the Flesh or something like that. And it's a pair of papers, it's a really super paper, um, but where he explains that, as he puts it, according to Aristotle, animal organism is, as he calls it, metaphysically insulated. It's a, it's a metaphysical island. And by this, he means that nothing that constitutes the inner process of the organism can be explained through and by the nature of things as it is seen independently of that inner process. So you cannot, as we're come, think of uh, explaining the, um, as we're, inner process of um, the organism of the animal by as well the chemical properties of um, the materials that are in there because they are actually turned and transformed as made internal to the, uh, the order of the organism and so they're metaphysically insular. Now, um, Fry here, Frey, is right on the essential point. The living individual, the organism, and thereby its organs are incapable of entering into mechanical and chemical transactions. Hegel remarks that while it is possible to consider organs as elements of mechanical and chemical relations, when the organism is so considered, it is considered precisely not as living, but as dead. I have this on the, um, on the, on the paper, yeah, on, the, on the hand of it. Uh, this, this word. I think he even says this, that an organism is mechanically and chemically unaffectable. Yet Frey is wrong to conclude that the living individual is an island within a sea of mechanical chemical objectivity. That's his image. That's the mechanical chemical objectivity in that these islands, organisms. That's wrong. Indeed, the conclusion contradicts his correct observation or anyway its ground. Organs are incapable of entering into mechanical and chemical relations because teleology is the truth of objectivity. An end has no mechanical cause because it subordinates mechanical causality to itself. The living individual is the truth of teleology in which the universality of teleology its subordination of the mechanical chemical objectivity is consummated. And this means that there can be no objectivity next to, around, surrounding the living individual. The living individual is not placeable within anything. That's a true answer to the placement problem. Sorry, you will, you will, you will see how uh, this um, is not nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> that the living individual cannot be placed within mechanical chemical objectivity does not mean that it is to be placed without it. So I, we have a trouble phrase right and say we can't place it inside it but he says okay it's an island it's placed as well without it. The animal is the universe it's the whole. Now um, it may, sorry, more and Frey will leave this out. Um, sorry. Um, okay, good. Now, um, However, when we stop here and think of the living individual as organism and its subjective process, um, 
we face a collapse of our thought, um, namely a loss of all determinacy and a becoming of it as, as empty. Um, we, what happens to Frey is in effect that within the metaphysical island, he cannot retain the mechanical chemical determinacy of um, the organs and thereby um, he cannot um, maintain the articulation of the organism into organs. Um, his living individual comes to be in effect a simple unity, but not a negative unity. <laughs> it's a simple unity for him. And actually, because as we saw before, the articulation even of internal teleology depends on its having subsumed mechanical chemical nature and thereby depends on the determinacy understandable in mechanical, in mechanical chemical terms of the, um, of the, of the organs. Now, I think um, uh, that um, um, the conclusion from this, so how do, you re how do you really retain the idea of the individual animal as determinant? We've emphasized, so, so we can put it like this, we've emphasized its universality and thereby seems to have collapsed it into a simple unity and are no longer able to recognize it as determinant. Um, now, um, the animal um, must be distinguished from, and indeed it must be opposed to the mechanical chemical objectivity. The, the animal is determinant not in relation to some other thing, it is determinate in opposing itself to the mechanical chemical world as a whole. So what we see here, actually, what I said before about the self-opposition of the universal, this is uh, through which I propose to understand the external process. So, so in, in order to understand the animal as universal idea, we must uh, understand this universal as self-opposing. And so now we, 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 we get a, a conception of, of an animal in which it relates as a whole to what uh, another whole, uh, whereas Hegel says a totality. Uh, this is this, uh, this flow down, I forget the quotes, uh, you can, uh, um, I'm see. I see. Already, I'm already running out of time. Aren't I? I'm sorry. Is, is, okay, I have some more time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, in its life process, the animal acts on and is acted upon by determinate things of a specific mechanical and chemical nature. The animal's organs and members enter into mechanical and chemical interactions. The lion's spit acts on the meat that it licks. It's a chemical interaction. Its teeth exert force on the spinal marrow of its prey. Mechanical process. The individual throws itself into the fray of the mechanical and chemical processes. It floods the coastlines of the metaphysical island. Der Konflikt seiner Glieder mit den äußerlichen Dingen. Yet, uh, yet the animal re therein remains universal. It does not become a mechanical or chemical object. While it acts on and is acted upon by determinate things of a determinate nature, its interaction is not a mechanical or chemical process. As Hegel has put it before, the organism is unaffectable mechanically. It is unaffectable in and through the mechanical and chemical conflict into which it throws itself because every such mechanical or chemical transaction is, now these are Hegel's words, 
immediately ruptured, immediately ruptured. Um, for every such mechanical or chemical transaction is subsumed and is subsumed immediately under the purposive activity of the animal as a whole. So what, what we need is we need the animal or the animal is universal, retains its universality, not by being a metaphysical island, but by throwing itself into a conflict, the conflict of its members with the mechanical reality. But this conflict, well, I think now makes it a mechanical object among mechanical objects or a chemical, a chemical substance uh, among chemical substances. No, it doesn't, because every such process is immediately ruptured. Immediately, in every moment, it is turned around, reversed in its logical nature. The rupture of the mechanical process is the reversal of its logical character. A mechanical or chemical transaction, as such, is the becoming other than uh, it was uh, of each of its terms. That's the nature of mechanical and chemical. Uh, it's, it's the other ring of the, uh, of the other. Um, um, so, and now, um, and, and therefore, when a mechanical or chemical transaction is a nexus of means to end, the means is changed in being used, and in being used, the means is used up. This was already pointed out. Yeah, this is an important, important point. This is because the mechanical transaction itself is the othering. So if the mechanical transaction is subsumed under the end, it is at the same time an othering of the means. It's using up, and, and precisely with respect to the a determination in which it is purposive, right? The knife becomes blunt, the sharp knife becomes blunt by cutting yeah, the, uh, and, and so on, this, 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 this kind of thing. But now, the living individual interacts with the mechanical object, it turns itself into a means, and therein it is changed, it is used up, it uses itself up. Yet, and this is now the immediate rupture, the immediate rupture of the process, this production, the animals becoming other, is immediately its reproduction, the animals remaining the same. Throwing itself into the fray of chemical and mechanical interaction, the animal dissolves itself. There's a way in which Hegel himself speaks, the oh, this is Auflösung, Auflösung, this is self-dissolution. The animal, the animal dissolves itself, yet this dissolution is immediately its recovery. Yeah, this is this doubleness of the process, the immediate rupture is this doubleness, and we need to hold on to both sides as the same, self-dissolution, self-reproduction. Yeah? Um, okay, that, that is the as we're general form is now. Um, um, this process as a whole is the idea as immediate idea in this at this stage um, and it's a self-opposition of the animal by which it is universal and in such a way as to be determined um, now um, therefore as Hegel puts it life the genus life this is one of my really favorite messages so to talk, the genus life has two species. The two species are the living individual and objective, um, external objectivity. Well, one thing, species of life, what are those? A parrot uh, and a mouse. No, the species of life are these two. This, this is a way of, like, perverse way of speaking uh, because uh, of course, what is it of, of which knowledge and reality are the species? The idea, the, other, the idea is the genus. I mean, this is, this is like, which makes, I think, implicitly plays on, is what ironically, on the idea of Aristotle that being is not a genus. Is it, of course, this is not a genus. But if we say it's a genus, then it's got these two species, which are both the same. <laughs> and the process is nothing other than the realization of that sameness, you know, the, as it were, denial of the rejection, the proof that what appears as other is no other at all. Um, now, I'm going to say just a little bit about consciousness, and then I, I can just do this in an improvised fashion. Now, and this is, um, we need to see 
um, that this, this, this logical break between the internal process and the external process. The internal process is an interaction of the organs. The external process is a process, the, uh, um, the terms of which are the animal as a whole and the external objectivity, yeah, which, which uh, now it's been observed many, by many that the animal acts as a whole, the animal acts. It's not that my arm does anything, I do, I do, yeah? And it's not that the, that the cat's mouth does something when it bites into the, sorry, the cat's mouth does something when it bites into the mouse, it's the cat. Now, um, now um, that the animal as a whole acts in a way that's, that, so it can't be reducible to anything to be said about the parts because the articulation of the animal into parts, namely organs, depends. That was my argument. Sorry, I don't, I don't know whether that came through enough. I mean, I said the internal articulation of the organism would collapse unless the organism as a whole opposed itself to the other. This means that this opposition to the other is not reducible to any process which may be described as activity of the parts. And so this is, this is the, it's a, the logical barrier to any like, the kind of redu reductions uh, you know, that Stephen Holger was talking about. Yeah? Uh, um, now, this, this means, however, that there is a form of activity of the animal as a whole that's not reducible to the parts. And in fact, that is, I'm going to assert now here, consciousness. Yeah? Um, or further, the soul, uh, the, uh, the way in which the animal is soul is it's, it's acting as a simple unity, not, not, as, as we're, not on account of its parts, but on the contrary. As it, it's being active as a simple unity. That is what its soul is. Yeah, but it, it, this, the, this, this discussion of how the soul, I'm going to speak in this way, this is of course something that Hegel is really very, in, insistent upon it. There's the soul, there's the body. Now, how are these two things now? How should, how should they get together? Now, um, what is an animal body? It's an organism. What is an organism? Organism is itself opposition to the other. So it's argument. Therefore, and in that way, the organism is soul because it's simple unity and active as simple unity. And thereby we can understand the peculiar character of perception and desire or states of no, acts of consciousness, consciousness yeah, is said of the animal as a whole. That's also been observed, but not really, I think, uh, sorry, I try to bring out its significance. The animal sees, not any part of it sees. I mean, people say that the brain thinks that's now most obvious nonsense, but it's even wrong to say the eye sees, the eye sees nothing, the animal sees. Um, and its unity of consciousness is a simple unity. It's not a unity of parts that come together. It's not, sorry, there are two forms of unity. There's where the unity of the animal as organism and its unity as simple, its unity of consciousness. And that's a different form of unity. And, that, and that's why, why, why is the soul simple? Because it's as where the simplicity of the animal. But it is the unity of the animal, the form of unity that it is, and that uh, which is its own self-opposition to the other. That's what there. So um, that I think uh, should do it and should make good, partially anyway, on my claim that the science of consciousness is um, an impediment to the understanding of uh, consciousness. Thank you. Then let's begin with Adam. I have two questions. One is short and for now, what is if we have time at the end? Mm -hmm. uh, my first is I'm a tremendous uh, collector of definitions of negative unity. Might <laughs> I have yours? Oh, negative um, unity um, is unity through uh, exclusion or through negation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. so um, the unity, so the, for example, the negative unity of um, um, like in the in the 
chapter Dasein, I think it is. It's a it's unity through the the, ex, um, the exclusion of one determination uh, mm -hmm. by another. So that that's uh, or but here the organism negative unity is um, it is a negative unity, a simple but negative unity mm -hmm. um, is uh, that it is unity through the negation of the um, um, independent nature of the organs. Yeah? So it's not, it, it's not, uh, it, uh, that is the way in which it is a unity. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, our next question is from the, the chat from uh, Stephen. Are you ready? Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, hello, Sebastian. Nice to see you again. It's been a while. <laughs> Hope you're keeping well. Um, thank you. I thought that was very good. I thoroughly enjoyed it and, and don't really have any major disagreements. I just wanted to um, uh, respond to one question you put but then didn't answer, uh, answer uh -huh. and also suggest something that would kind of extend perhaps uh, your analysis almost backwards into the logic. Um, you asked at one point, you know, where did this difference come from uh, between you know, thought and being? Why, why did we ever come up with the idea that, 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 that thought or knowing or word wouldn't somehow belong to being? Um, and there is obviously a very immediate answer to that. And that is the very, very sharp distinction Kant draws between uh, discursive thinking and intuition. Um, and what's particularly of interest, it seems to me, are in those uh, that, uh, footnote that uh, I forget the number of in, in the, um, the paralogisms, where he's um, criticizing Descartes and arguing that, that in the very thought, ich denke, of course I'm aware that I am, but I'm not aware that I am in the very thought, ich denke. <laughs> Rather, that's accompanied by uh, eine unbestimmte Empfindung. Um, and Kant works so hard to keep thought and being apart, even the idea das ich bin is not the intuition of my sein. So I would have thought anyway, that's one answer to you. Now, obviously, that, that um, doesn't answer the, 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 the grand question, perhaps, but it's one immediate thing. And I think it's what Hegel focuses on. So that was my first point. Um, the second point really is just to, I mean, I think the way you explained the, the particularly I found very illuminating that um, your explanation of the way in which the animal uh, at the level of its parts can interact chemically and mechanically with uh, uh, mechanical and, and, and chemical objectivity outside it, but it doesn't do so as an organism. I found that really very illuminating. Mm -hmm. What it reminded me of though is that we get similar structures earlier in the logic where there isn't a simple causal external effect of A on B. Think right back to the distinction between a determination and constitution, Bestimmung and Beschaffenheit, where the very idea of being something exposes it to something else um, and everything is vulnerable to, be, uh, to, uh, to being changed by other things, but it's vulnerable in a specific way that's governed by its own Bestimmung. So the fact that there isn't a simple mechanical um, effect of A on B is already present in a sense at the very level of being something at all. And then one thinks in measure of the specifying measure, which is more particularly chemical, where Hegel is, is, is interested in the phenomenon of specific heat and the way in which, again, you apply heat to a piece of paper and you get a different effect from applying heat to a pan. Now, you might say, okay, this has nothing to do with the animal and I absolutely don't want to reduce what you've said to that. I just want to see that there is a little bit of a, um, of a continuity uh, there and that the idea that causation isn't always mechanical actually extends quite a long way back. And, and I think that allows us to perhaps understand the animal as in somehow rendering explicit something that belongs to beings more generally. Okay, that's, that's it. Um, well, I just, um, you can say when I was asking the question, why did anyone uh, you know, go in for this opposition or this, these pairs? I was uh, speaking rhetorically. I mean, I think it's, and I wasn't thinking about kind of, I was thinking of Parmenides. I mean, it was a, 
thinking and being. You, you place them on the same plane. I mean, my, my, yeah. my question was, I mean, if we, so when we recognize the universality of the second term, B, um, then it appears if we form the pair thinking and being, we are um, setting thinking apart. I mean, we make it, we, we, we oppose thinking and being. That is to say, it seems we re, um, we deny being to thinking. We, we, we deny that thinking is one of the beings. Let's put it that way. One of, one of the things we, that have being. How many things have being? Thinking, why shouldn't thinking have being? Now, um, and I, as far as I know, analytic philosophers of mind have the immediate certainty that thinking is to be found among the many beings. And this is the kind of being they want to have a theory about. And so they go on. Um, but this is um, excluded by, or, or, or this is incompatible with the very, as it were, elementary and sort of um, definitive posture of the philosopher that expresses itself in thinking and being. So, it, so thereby now we have a diff, uh, need a different form of comprehension. So I think I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, sorry, this is in the context of the so-called placement problem. Now people want, okay, okay, well, Nagel, he's, 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 he's crazy, Nagel is crazy. He says, I'm the objective self, I'm nowhere, not in this world and so on. This makes no sense to think that I'm Thomas Nagel, you know, and this is really mysterious. And people say, oh, wow, now this is, this is he's raving. As Enscom says, they're raving. But as you, as you know, in Enscom's, um, the first person, the people who rave, they're the good ones. Yeah, they, they're the good ones. Yeah, because they even, they at least see something. They, they see something really deep and essential, which those who don't rave, like Strawson, Strawson doesn't rave. He said, well, I'm not I referring expression, of course, very special and so on and so forth, but it's among the, uh, among the manifold objects. I pick out a particular one by saying I, and so on. Strawson doesn't rave. And Enscombe says, more raving, please. So I want more raving. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think the solution of the, there should be no ambition to be able to say, well, well the mind is in the world. And there, uh, and there should be no ambition to be able to say the animal is in the world. No, the animal is not in the world. As, I'm sorry, the animal is something that is not conceivable through the concept of objectivity. It is not to be placed as an element in anything. It is the whole unto itself. How is it? There's the progression. And there's a certain limit to it in which it is. And therefore, we progress to knowledge. Yeah, where, 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 but but, but um, to the idea of knowledge, yeah. But so I was, I was not myself having any trouble uh, seeing how one would, uh, I mean, sorry, I started this way. When you do philosophy, this is originally what comes up, mind and world. Even Quine, great analytic philosopher, what does he write? Word and object. This is what he writes. This is the title of his book. This is what comes to him immediately without any sort of, even though, according to himself, a word is an object. According to his concept of an object, if you see, he explains what an object is, it's clear that he must say, is committed to saying that a word is an object. Yet, he calls this book word an object. So I, I, just, I think this immediate, I mean, our task is to comprehend, you know, how um, this is, as it were, the as were, original um, articulation of philosophical thought. And I try to do this by arguing that it is, as it were, internal to the universal idea itself to be this opposition. So philosophy comes about through the absolute abstraction. This is, this, is, this is the rupture, you know, with everyday and common understanding. And the rupture is the absolute abstraction. And then this absolute abstraction leading, being the universal idea is this self-opposition. So I was actually not seeking for historical roots for this opposition, where it seems to me to be, as it were, just that in which the medium of philosophical <laughs> thought as were originally. So, no. 
as a test. So, because what happens with Kant is then that that opposition you talk about gets yeah. pushed, to the, that abstraction gets pushed to the point. Yeah, yeah, no, which, I know. He says, at least the relation between the yeah. universal and the universal is lost. Yeah, yeah, no, he denies, he, he, he rejects Parmenides, which is a bad thing yeah. to do. Uh, you should never come. Uh, you should never speak. <laughs> but 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 uh, yeah, no, that's right. He, he says thinking is empty, um, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's disaster. Um, that's yeah, that, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Of course. Um, so uh, second point was um, right. This thing. Oh, okay. Well, this is an interesting suggestion. Um, but I I am. Um, I want to hold fast to the quite specific meaning, meaning of immediate rupture. And mm -hmm. so there's, there is, um, and it being a response to, to phrase. So I really think phrase, that, uh, that's a challenge. That's a good challenge. Like the, I mean, if you want to uh, resist these um, reductionisms, the first thing you will want to say is what phrase is. He's against re the post-reductionists. So there's nothing, it's impossible to have any comprehension of the organism through a description of the chemical natures of its, of its matter. Uh, on the contrary, everything that goes on in the organism, everything that you may state as a principle of its organs is an, artic is an articulation of your idea of the organism. That's, that's, that's phrase point. Uh, and that's, uh, that's going to point. But now, how is this? Now again, we have this placement problem, and I and I um, I presented this identity of self dissolution and self reproduction as what enable or, or what makes it clear how the animal, as I said, as I put it, can flood the metaphysical coastlines without drowning. <laughs> Sorry, this is too much metaphor. Yeah. But uh, so um, uh, I'm quite open to the suggestion that uh, there are precursors. Um, um, I just intend to uh, point out how it works here, that structure, in order to uh, respond to uh, a specific difficulty in mm -hmm. thinking the animal in such a way as to in such a way as to comprehend it as the truth of objectivity. Yes, and I, I completely accept that, and I thought you made your case very well. I'm not disputing that. And, and just to, to, to round off. No, no, that's very I, interesting. I, I would have to... Um, yeah, I, I'm looking at a passage where, where Hegel says um, that the mechanical thing doesn't uh, wirken simply auf ein lebendiges. It's wirkt nicht als Ursache, sondern erregt es. It, it stimulates it. And I think that captures what you've got in mind. I just wanted to suggest that there are... Um, moments that happen earlier in the logic which are not completely dissimilar and if one doesn't highlight those the problem is one will get a rupture between what's going on in the organism and everything else yeah. and, and that's just what I don't want to to have I think the idea of a continuity mm -hmm. and life rendering explicit what being at variety of different yeah. levels is that 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 would just support your view and it would prevent life being too much at odds with everything that's come before in the logic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm, I do not want to disagree with, with that at all. On the contrary, I want to agree with it. Um, yet, to, to, also, I want to say that to me, the, I don't know, justification, shall I say that? Justification is a mediocre concept, though, so I'm not going to use it. But um, the, that the idea figures in the logic and thus is a specification of the universal idea which is first presented as being yeah that to me is fundamentally made out by the way in which the animal appears as the truth of objectivity i, I, I mean i can i can see that it will be further illuminated by the, the continuities or the um similar forms of um, um duality of um, description that you um, are pointing to. Um, but in any case, I think the, uh, the uh, as were, the comprehension of the idea as, of, the, uh, of life as that which is a result of the 
resources. Self, self determination of the universal idea, which first figures as being, that 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 needs to be understood. Uh, so, I, so I always uh, therefore making a lot of fuss uh, about the transition. Yeah, be, because um, I think there's a feature about these transitions which are partly a reason why they always seem so weird. And to me, I, I don't know what you think of that, but to me, it's somewhat like uh, the transition, uh, the transitions in the phenomenology. So you describe the way in which one form of consciousness despairs, and then a new form appears. And the new form is described in ways that you are familiar with, but you would not have thought of them as you know coming now like I, I know when first thinking appears you know and when it gives a definition of thinking that, that, that that's in the in the stoicism chapter i said uh, when it gives it i don't know again and again and it's and it's here again uh where we are called upon to see that what we logically think under the idea of life is in fact a determinate negation <laughs> of external teleology. And that's a moment of surprise. I think the further transition we've been discussing briefly has, is the same kind of difficulty because, because it's not, I mean, sorry, if I read this, you know, the, um, okay, the animal in its genus process is such that the genus is only real in the individual. But uh, the truth of it is, you know, that I know, the universal is itself the individual, and that's now thinking. That's now knowledge. Now we are the idea of knowledge. We knew before, or we were speaking of knowledge all the time, we we're speaking of life all the time, but we have guessed, you know, that it is sort of the genus being for itself, that that is what knowledge is. I mean, no, but, but this is so sort of the form of comprehension that the logic yields. I think that. In which you see, for example, that a logical condition of the idea of knowledge is life, you know, which Kant didn't dream of because it just started with knowledge. But um, yeah, so so these these as were turns, you know, in which a certain description of or a certain articulation of a form of thought is then given a different denomination. Now that's life. That these are the moments of real. I know illumination. I think. I think because because there we we are called. We are we are sort of brought to a, an insight into the logical character of something that we've been talking about all the time, and, but didn't what or didn't dream of as we're thinking through that kind of logical um, progression. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was okay. Thank you. Okay. I answer more briefly now. Thank Sorry, you. please. <laughs> okay, well, it's great that you're talking about transitions because I have problems with it. <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, so I was wondering how it really works, the transition from teleology to the idea of life, because you said every means as a means is an end, and that's finally a disaster for um, external teleology. And I understand it this way that, okay, of course, if you want to comprehend reality only by means of external teleology, it turns out, out that you can't, because actually every means is already mm -hmm. an end from this perspective. But from the other perspective, like coming from the idea of life, I thought one could also say it's not that much a disaster because inner purposiveness one could also argue that inner purposiveness makes um, external purposiveness possible in the first place, because otherwise it wouldn't get going. Uh, so yeah, maybe no. it's just a disaster from one side. And not no, from... no, that's, uh, that's yeah. right. I was okay. thinking about the mm -hmm. disaster uh, in relation to, uh, to the um, articulation of an idea of objectivity. Mm -hmm. okay. now, it's a, it's a yeah. disaster okay. in the way in which a regress okay. is always a disaster. And it mm -hmm. regress threatens the intelligibility of the first step. That's 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 a um, point that certain mm -hmm. Wittgenstein makes. But it's it's clear if in the as he says in the um, if in the first step you already see as where the form of the step already shows <laughs> that um, uh, the sequence is interminable. You don't know what you're doing in progressing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the regress is not a regress, 
And, mm -hmm. and, the, and the problem with the regress process is never that, oh my God, where am I going to find um, the last member? But the problem is I don't understand any transition along the, along the way. You know? So in that way, so exactly mm -hmm. as you said, if external teleology is to be my idea of the object, mm -hmm. okay, then it falls apart upon itself. And, um, but um, this is the, the logical analog. I understand that this is wrong, that other people may know about it, but this I understand as the logical analog of the despair of a form of consciousness, mm -hmm. you know, which despairs with its, uh, by its, through itself. It's okay. uh, anyway, so here, that form of that articulation of objectivity uh, undermines the uh, self collapses into, into nothing. But not into nothing. We just need to see that this is, in fact, the articulation of um, a, a, thought, a thought determination. That uh, um, so um, then, of course, um, we can see that all examples of external teleology that we can think of that are sound are located within life mm -hmm. yeah. or within human action. That's all. But uh, that's, that's not really, um, uh, for example, uh, again, greatly admired philosopher Thomas Nagel proposes in his terrific book, Mind and Cosmos, that we should think of nature as governed by teleological principles. So he, he proposes that as we're a higher form of thinking of objectivity through teleology. Mm -hmm. Now, that I think is in that where I'm, yeah, it comes to grief as a whole. Okay, thanks. But that yeah. also means that we now need to see, see the animal as they can ask the truth of objectivity. Mm -hmm. And this, this uh, mm -hmm. prevents yeah. us from just saying, I mean, so what I'm speaking of against is uh, also, that, I mean, there are, of course, the reductivists, kind of like those. And also these people that say, oh my God, well, there are many different things and they uh, are the proper object of different forms of explanation. And we shouldn't be so, you know, insistent upon just using one. There's just many flowers bloom. You know, these reductivists, they're just so sort of narrow minded. They just want to do everything mechanically. No, no, let's do something. It's like consciousness. On the occasion of encountering, we, we, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't yeah. yeah, so. yeah. This is something that Hegel rejects. It yeah. makes no sense. Yeah, um, and, and this, I think, can be seen in the same insight in which we understand how um, life, as it were, sustains um, the proper use of um, the idea of external theology. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. It's clarifying. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Uh, if you want to. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your for your talk. I enjoyed that quite a lot. Um, so I have a question about what you said about nothing can be explained about the individual in sure terms of particularity. So you can't use you know the mm -hmm. register of the special yes. to get at the heart of right. what an individual is, because yes. an individual is its own totality. Right. Right. However, we cannot also discard the particular because the, it seems to me that the particular is is when it's needed as yeah. a as a stepping stone to get to the individual, even though the individual is not the particular. So uh, the way I see it is kind of like for us to get to the singular, it has to be a negation of the negation. The first negation being the particular, and the second negation being the singular. I mean, so it's negating the particularity. So I. It's it's mm -hmm. the individual living individual is not in contrast to its circumstances simply, but it's its own totality, right? So it's negating those those um, those, those those things, and so I'm I'm wondering if um, you see like yeah, well, if, if, you, if you would agree with that or dispute that, and and then I also wonder about your notion of self opposition, whether or not that is particularity, right? Because the universal opposing it to itself doesn't that generate particularity? Uh, no, I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking that 
the self opposition, the two species of life are individual and what they call external objectivity. These, these are in excess. Get now perhaps to this um, point. Um, that's quote six. Yeah. Yeah, in, uh, this, this is actually the, the quote that I think um, is illuminating of the way in which the internal process can sustain itself only by being uh, or only through the external process. Der innerhalb des Individuums eingeschlossene Prozess des Lebens geht in die Beziehung zur vorausgesetzten Objektivität als solcher. Als Point Objectivity, das heißt, über, dadurch über, dass das Individuum in dem es sich als subjektive Totalität setzt, auch das Moment der Bestimmtheit als Beziehung auf die Äußerlichkeit zur Totalität wird. So determinacy is a relation to something other, but this must also be totality. So we cannot um, think of the determinacy of the animal as one that we understand through its difference from something other. Because in that case, the, the Bestimmtheit als Beziehung auf die Äußerlichkeit wouldn't be totality. Yeah, so, um, in stepping stone, I, don't, I mean, to the extent that it is the progression from external teleology where there is particularity, as I think you brought out, I mean, that's, this, is, this, is, this is part of the difficulty of that um, the means is not through itself the means, yet must be. There is a way to um, put uh, the difficulty of external teleology, I think, in, in a way that may be congenial to the way in which you spoke. Um, there, um, and this is because the means in external teleology figures as particularly determined, as, as having a particular determination in distinction to other things. And they have other determinations, or the same. Um, I think um, in order to I should say where what an individual is um, 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 I think Levinas says this uh, in an interview. He said that when I encounter another human being, um, in this I know consciousness, um, I'm not aware of any particular determination. I, um, I don't know the color of, of her eyes. <laughs> no, if, I, if I notice the color of the eyes, something's off. <laughs> so I mean, his point is <laughs> that that the uh, um, of course I mean you know, these are blue eyes and brown eyes. You know this this particularity. Yeah, but that's uh, sort of something that's in a certain sense eclipsed. You know when I am conscious of another human being. And, uh, um, the, uh, and this is the, uh, the idea I have in mind, that, that, which I, I think is, um, I mean, people, is, uh, I'm sorry, this is, I'm um, going to go on about this, uh, through, uh, um, you know, there's this analytic philosophical discussion about love, which treats of the following difficulty. Now, can I give reasons for my love? If yes, then they have reasons will pertain to some determination of the loved one. But now it seems that I can replace her <laughs> by someone who's got the same. I, it seems I don't love her at all. I just love that, you uh, know, blue eyes or whatever it is. Uh, or uh, her laughter. Oh, yeah, anyway. So if someone came along with the same laughter, I would love her. Well, that seems terrible. <laughs> difficult love is not a relation to the particular at all. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, this is something I think looks for. Also, observes Knud Loxer. Do you know Knud Loxer? It's a terrific author. You should read Knud Lobster. He's a Danish theologian of uh, 60s, 70s. Ago. So um, it says, in, in love, as well, I don't know anything about the one that I love. But the things that I can say are, are the things that everyone can say. It's a, it, it, and that is not um, you know, something um, that's, as it were, formative of the. Because love is a relation of individual to individual. It's like, it's 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 not kind of um, good. Okay, that's that in, that's that's a way in which I think individual individuality negates particularity. Yeah, but it doesn't discard it because it seems to me if it does discard it, then how is the soul 
as a simple unity, not an island. Well, uh, I'm sorry, the soul. It, 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 we were now yeah. jumping on to as a well, human individual, which is, I think, different still because human individual is, is where through its recovery um, only it's like, um, life. I, I, I would I would love to talk about the, the, the way in which life returns in the absolute idea, but but I won't. But if we only speak about the animal. There's a certain way in which the animal is universal, and which which is through its, as we're acting as a whole against and on objectivity as such. Yeah, that that is something that is not our individual. This is not the way in which we are universal. We don't need to. So we don't need to prove as well our universality by <laughs> entering with our members into the fray of. Um, the mechanical chemical world. Yeah, uh, the idea of the good is different from animal action. Human action is sorry, now I'm gonna rave, but human action is completely different from animal action, precisely because animal action is the way in which I've described it, is is that form of universality. But human action being action um, that's that when you shift to the good doesn't mean that. I mean that's that's the reason why this is so um Neglected, I think it is. It's already, you know, it's a fullness of objectivity to itself. It's, it doesn't need to. I, I don't need to prove it. Sorry, there, there's um, there's a passage that the animal gives itself the certainty of its truth as we're by as we're engaging into in this um, conflict. And so it is this. No, it gives itself the truth of this certainty. So the animal is the certainty of being. The external objectivity is not other than it. It's already, as such, that certainty. Now he says it gives itself the truth of that certainty by you know, eating it up or by pushing it aside, or, I don't know, by making a house out of it or whatever. This is this is how the animal shows, proves, or gives itself the truth of the certainty. Now, when I think the good, I do not need to. I do not need to give myself the truth. Of the certainty. And that's, that's the that's the way. Right? That's the sense in which it is absolute. Now, therefore, I think. Sorry, how did I get you this? <laughs> That's a wonderful note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we can't take all the questions we have, but we've run out of time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. One more round of applause for Sebastian Ravings.